Great, here we go. So um, I'm going to just briefly mention, uh, reiterate what Thomas said. So my role, so I'm co-editor in chief with Thomas on Bioinformatics Advances. The journal's been running for two years, so this is a, by way of a little bit of an advert here. Just to say this isn't, you know, I've been doing the editing game for quite some time. So 20 years ago, I was the editor for the Nucleic Acid Research Database issue for five years. Uh, then uh, senior editor for bioinformatics with Alfonso Valencia for, I think, 12 years and uh, current protocols in bioinformatics for three years as well. So I calculated that in my time, I've been editor for over 2000 manuscripts. So I apologize to all those people that I rejected. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, OK. Um, so yeah, the journal's going really well. We're expecting 350 submissions uh, this year uh, with about 200 acceptances. We're very happy to have more of them. So we would really like to get your submissions. We take transfers from a variety of other journals where they don't fit the scope or uh, impact criteria so they can get transferred with reviews and we can use those reviews to make very quick decisions. Um, overall, our average time for first decision is just 27 days. And uh, I'm really proud of the work that our editors do in making those decisions and giving advice and triaging reviewer comments. Okay, so yeah, and Thomas and I would be really happy to um, discuss potential submissions with you. Okay, so uh, I'm now uh, wondering what's going on under the <laughs> lectern. Um, so I wanted to introduce Brandolini's law for those who don't know it. Uh, if, you, if you don't, you've probably sort of heard things about it, but the amount of energy needed to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude bigger than that needed to produce it. This is going to need to change clearly because it's uh, probably at least two or three orders of magnitude easier to create the bullshit now. So now, um, large language models, uh, they are the editor's worst nightmare, as I'll describe a bit later, but they can be incredibly useful. We've already seen the, an extreme version of this uh, from Christian, but okay, so uh, I apologize to Michelle, who sat at the back, who can't read this. Um, but basically, so I've just asked ChatGPT here, I wanted to come up with something funny about, you know, a different acronym for what GPT meant to sort of, and so it came up with uh, so GPT could be generative plausible tales, which is quite nice. And I asked it for another sort of dozen or so, and it came up with a yeah a fairly funny bunch of them, you know. And, and you can use this to to generate talks and so on quite easily. But uh, you know, there are many places where uh, the large language models can be used less usefully. So here's an example. So uh, LLMs can generate bullshit easily. So I uh, asked it, so I said, please write the abstract for a scientific paper titled MicroRNA MER122 uh, Overexpression Reverses the Aging Process in Mouse Neurons. Okay, I don't think it does. <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm a seer or something, but no, so, I mean, it's, it's written an extremely convinced, well, no, it's not convincing. And a plausible abstract, okay? I think it wouldn't stand up to any intense scientific scrutiny. Um, but this was the moment of, of a few seconds of work. Um, okay, so text, but what about data? Yes, it can fabricate data too. So the next thing I did, so I've asked it to create a table showing the expression level of MER122 relative to a positive and negative control versus cellular age, uh, where there is a negative correlation between expression level and cellular age. Please show five different levels of expression of MER122. Please include estimates of error. And so it's come up with some text, a plausible, well, the table's crap. It, it doesn't make any sense. But then I've had another go and reprompted it and asked it to sort of reorganize things. And, and it comes up with something that kind of looks like, you know, real data. Um, so yeah, people can write fake papers quite easily now. Of course, who would do such a thing? Certainly no one in this room, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but anyone who, who is on Twitter and, and follows the, the fantastic Elizabeth Dick, who uh, looks for image manipulation in papers, I mean, there's a lot of this going on. And actually a lot of it from really serious people in serious labs. 
And this is very on the edge of, of what, what's acceptable and sometimes very far beyond that. So there are people out there who think it's okay maybe to make small changes in their data. And then, and then we get to the more extreme end. And so uh, we have uh, paper mills. So these are uh, groups of people who are writing fake, almost you know, completely fictitious papers and submitting them to journals. They're selling authorships for these papers and they're getting through. And these, sometimes they go to rather poor quality journals, um, but no, they also get into more serious journals too. Okay, so you can argue, well, this, this isn't the real case. You don't have to worry about that at bioinformatics advances, right? We only get sort of real, real sort of science from, from good scientists. But so what happens if we do get one? And, and it worries me, the scientific review process, we all sort of would love to think that this is the perfect uh, sort of barrier to, to bad science, but I don't think it is. So reviewers generally assume good faith on the part of the authors. I think that goes at least in our field okay we don't set out reviewing a paper thinking i wonder if someone's made up some parts of this paper unfortunately not all reviewers are equally observant or careful in fact those observant uh, and careful reviewers are ex an extremely rare breed and we uh, love you dearly <laughs> Reviewers are often not expert in all aspects of the paper. You know, very often I can I can review the biology, but the, the technical aspects of the, you know, the statistics are, are beyond me. And so uh, a good reviewer will say what they can and can't review to the editor. Um, but it's really not always clear. Of course, there's uh, essentially uh, little to no reward for being a careful reviewer. And we're all very, very busy. And also it's worth mentioning that different standards apply to different fields. So across, you know, maths, where this is, you know, you have to get it right. So you check line by line everything. The review process, you're not going to get your reviews back in two weeks uh, in the maths field, I think, um, through computer science to, to uh, computational biology and biology. And, and even within subfields, the, the approaches here are different, whether the paper is using methodology that's Kind of well known and trusted so maybe it doesn't get as much of a review as if it's introducing something new so i uh, you know i the, the the review process we select from the population of all possible reviewers we uh, do a not quite random sample of two or three of them maybe four if you're unlucky um and uh yeah so not all of the problems will be caught and sometimes none of the problems may be caught depending on your luck or lack of luck. So hopefully I've convinced you that there, there are, you know, uh, there can potentially be serious problems, but I've focused on the, the worst problems here. I think it's also worth focusing and just for a second on the gray area, okay? If, if you use ChatGPT or something to write your introduction, okay, Line, maybe that's fine if you go through and you check it line by line and you're convinced of everything but my concern is that many people will be wanting to write this quickly they won't check everything very carefully the fact it sounds plausible okay it's probably fine whereas actually chat gpt may have made those inferences on its own and they may not be supported this is one of my great concerns these models the field is changing very rapidly so maybe in the future, these models will get better at asserting evidence for any of their statements. I hope they do. And I think, you know, when that comes, then, then maybe the conversation needs to change. So based on all of this, IFCB, uh, the Board of Directors and, and, and myself and others decided that we would write a policy for acceptable use of large language models. And I'm going to go through that um, for you now. So, uh, yeah, there's a URL here. It's very easy to search for. So it was uh, drafted in consultation with the board of directors, and it's intended for all scientific submissions to uh, ISCB conferences, as well as research submissions to uh, bioinformatics and bioinformatics advances. And maybe other journals will adopt it in the future, I hope. 
And so we put in the caveat, as I've just said, things are changing very fast in this field. This policy is going to change. Um, and it, in fact, you know, one change immediately is that people are using ChatGPT to review scientific papers. This is not cool. This is not cool at all. You shouldn't do that. And the policy will probably get updated fairly soon to reflect that. And NIH uh, also um, yeah, updated their policies to, to rule that out. OK, so we divided the policy into common acceptable uses of large language models and common unacceptable uses. So let's go through the acceptable uses. So we think it is OK as an aid to correct written text. So things like spell checkers, grammar checkers, these things are already well baked into the, the kind of tools and software that you use, Word, Google Docs, these sorts of things. As an aid to language translation, okay, so actually we think this is very good for diversity and it's going to make for better quality written text from authors whose English is not their native language, that they will be able to write better text, but they're still responsible for the accuracy of the final text. Of course, Large language models are definitely a, a, an area for active study, and, and that's perfectly fine. Um, as an evaluation technique to assist in finding inconsistencies or other anomalies in the text, it's a bit like grammar sort of checking, I guess. Um, and it's permissible to use language model generated text, but those snippets you should say when they're generated, right? And this is more on the research side. And we get more interesting, so we think it's actually okay to use these models for assisting code writing. But again, the researcher is responsible for the correctness of the code, and we have things like GitHub Copilot and so on. I think this is going to become pretty ubiquitous. Um, but these, this code needs careful checking, and particularly as you get to more and more complex tasks. The model seems to do pretty well for documentation of code, actually, and so that's another allowable. Uh, area, but again, the researcher is responsible for making sure it's correct. Okay, so what is not allowed? Okay, so here are the common unacceptable uses. And this is really the critical one first. So it is not acceptable to use LLMs or related technologies to draft papers, including but not limited to text, figures, tables, references uh, from a prompt text. In essence, papers must be written by researchers. So this is quite strong. This is saying, do not use LLMs to write your paper. Will this stop people using LLMs? I'm, I'm not sure, but it will you know, make people think more seriously about that. You might, we might have discussions about, is it okay that I use an LLM to decide the structure of my paper? And then I write the sections, maybe that's okay. It's, it's, it's gonna be difficult and gray. And so hopefully we can have some discussions about these issues. Uh, LLMs may not be authors of your paper. Please do not make them authors of your paper. Uh, this is not allowed, and uh, particularly because it, they would not fulfill the requirements of authorship as laid out in the ICMJ guidelines. Okay, um, so please don't do that. Uh, you could put them in the acknowledgements. I don't think we'd, you know, you can say thank you, ChatGPT. Um, unfortunately, your paper will almost certainly then be rejected for breaking <laughs> the common unacceptable use, but you can do that. Um, so at present, we do not intend to systematically detect usage of these models, um, but we will uh, investigate any reported or suspected usage on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so here I say the policy does not cover writing reviews. By that, I mean reviews of papers, not review articles. Um, so I think that will come in as an additional unacceptable use pretty soon. Okay, so I think I'm just about out of time. And uh, I am very happy to take questions and feedback. If you have no questions... <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop there. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. And even recently, I was a little bit not sure why it was unacceptable to use this tool to review because I mean, it helps you to understand things that always take a long, long time. So you can go through the details and the important parts of your paper very fast. But recently, I, I, I wanted to share this with the room because the problem with these models that are online is that we don't know who's processing information. 
And the problem with reviewing a paper that is confidential is that you are putting information from other authors in a model that you don't know who is able to see. So it's a confidentiality uh, breakthrough. Uh, so I just want to say why it's also because in my mind is what the problem? There's no problem for me if I have it installed locally in my computer. But it is a problem because you are using other people's uh, confidential information. And that's okay, so this is, this comes back to the NIH. Uh, article about why they said that they were stopping allowing people to use large language models for um, uh, review. The article is deeply flawed. The policy is good. I think the policy is absolutely correct, but I think their reasoning and, and argumentation are completely flawed. You just have to look at the comments of that article to uh, all the reasons are laid out very clearly there. That yeah, you can use local models. Uh, you don't need to use online models, as you as you mentioned. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, as with all these things, it's rather gray, and I think there's a conversation to be had. So I think what we're envisaging here is it's not cool that you pump the paper through ChatGPT and say, please write my review. That's clearly not cool, right? Because there was no brain power. You made no efforts to review the paper. If you put it through ChatGPT and said, can you give me some ideas of areas that I might need to pay more attention to, and you still did the full review, and you checked over that stuff. Okay, great. I mean, that's that's okay if it helps you do a better review. But I, I think the real fear is that it will it will make people will get a long plausible review from someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. And honestly, we get enough of those already. <laughs> Hi, Alex. So I'm over. Um, do you think it would be a good idea that some people in this audience did an actual test to see whether bioinformatics advances would capture fabricated papers? I mean, having some <laughs> there where we actually intentionally know that this was fake, rather than you being subjected to somebody doing it not openly? I have to consult briefly with uh, my <laughs> co editor. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> no. <laughs> we 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 could we could talk to you. <laughs> so it's an interesting idea. Um oh the problem is I, I think yeah, if you were trying to fool us. I think you could do it I, because you would make it very plausible, along with a very plausible tone. Um, someone who took less care may may not get through. But yeah, do we do we dare do the experiment? I personally, I think you, I, it would be much better done at bioinformatics. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I have two points. One, so if if we know that, so if the current system is that's the that community potentially affects papers that may have been written by AI, um, and and then inform us the editors about potential issues, should we rethink the retract the retraction mechanism, like flagging papers, how we flag papers, how soon we flag papers? I mean, I don't know how this happens by the market, but this is highlighted as an, as an issue as being a very slow process, right? So that could be. Maybe one system change to adapt to the new reality of LMS. Secondly, if the problem is that you don't want people to review papers using LMS, why don't editors send a pre review from an LM to the peer reviewers and just basically get rid of their um, potential curiosity of doing it just by presenting them? Like, we already got this from an LM, but we need your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, what I want is three expert reviews from expert reviewers where they've taken care to read the paper, check the software. Um, I think, you know, we what we haven't done yet is um, change the, the text in our letters to reviewers to make it clear that they shouldn't be using these, these models for, for reviewing. In terms of the retractions, I'm not quite sure I understand where where what your sort of proposal is. What would the change in mechanism be? Community flagging of this may be AI generated. 
Ah, uh, community flagging of that this might be AI generated. Yeah. So I bet the people is it Pub Peer that yeah. do a lot of this. I I bet they're already sort of thinking and and checking these things. There's a lot of software out there for that people are using for detecting all sorts of bogus activities um, in in the paper writing field, and I'm sure that they'll be using this technology too. Um, so, so you started your talk with a discussion of bullshit and accuracy, but I'm wondering if the real issue is not more like plagiarism rather than accuracy, because as the models evolve, they will get accurate eventually, and then who did the work? What's the what's the agency yeah. behind the discoveries? Isn't that the bigger issue actually? So, so yeah, the, a, a few issues around plagiarism. So one is that people do. <laughs> They copy other people's work and, and sometimes people self plagiarize they rewrite their own work in a different way and that becomes really easy with a, a language model um, so i think that kind of redundant publication style which is a problem people do that is yeah will be much more difficult to detect um, also there are issues around yeah though using language models and their plagiarism plagiarism generally of the language models because the whole of PubMed went into um, the chat GPT, for example. So it will generate sentences and statements, but it's not attributing them to uh, the person or the teams who came up with that knowledge. Um, if indeed that knowledge is knowledge, uh, not something they really like. So yeah, it's, um, there are huge amounts of issues and, and maybe this will be where I like to say that redundant publications, plagiarism is a, a more likely source of problems for us at the journal first. I wanted to bring up the issue of, of bias and novelty and these issues that we're viewing in upload writing papers, but um and make some comment on this. But we all tend to you know get a paper without thinking about it. We think, oh I know Dr. Smith, Dr. Smith is a good person in terms of quality science. I'm already positively disposed. If I get one from Dr. Jones and I've never heard of Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones may be excellent, but I've already had a bias. And it seems like that kind of bias is likely to be buried in the data in which the is working. And so is that an issue that you're viewing? And oh, I mean, I can also imagine in terms of writing your paper, even if your ideas are novel, the way it's fun in would be less likely to come out if it's written based on the like learning model. Yeah, absolutely. That there's a definitely a strong bias there. And I, I don't know, you know, if if for example I was writing a letter of recommendation for a student, my impression is that ChatGPT gives a much more American style a recommendation letter than a European style. So I need to, in my prompt, say, you know, tone this down a bit. Come on, they're not, <laughs> they're not that good. Um, uh, yeah. So, so there's definite biases about the, the inputs where where the information came from. That's for sure. I, I mean, the the bias about oh, you know, Professor X uh, wrote this paper. That's a really serious bias. I mean, I think you're, you're twice as likely to get, you know published if, if you're a, a well-known uh, researcher um, than, than someone uh, hasn't heard of. I, there's a gender bias there, I believe, as well. So these are more serious. I mean, you could imagine somehow using the language models to de-bias a paper that you sent it. Somehow you could send it out and have that information plausibly kind of smooshed out by the language model. And maybe we could use it in a sort of a positive way to reduce bias. Um, yeah, but it's really difficult to, to really anonymize things in that way. I was concerned about the suggestion that people could see a pre-review written by ChatGPT as <coughs> because then they they can buy the file. Ah, so this was the idea that Christian said about a pre-review. Yeah. Yes, um, um, yeah. Like, so I. Yeah, that's. I thought exactly what you said, but I didn't want to be rude to Christian and say his idea was stupid. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so here's, here's a question from Virtual, and that's uh, whether you think that the role of the senior author may change because, in, the, in some sense, the senior, senior author has the moral responsibility for the paper, and it seems to become more and more difficult to assume this responsibility given the technology. Uh, yeah, okay, so lots of parts to this. So one, one part is who did what in a paper? And usually it's very difficult to see. Actually, bioinformatics advances, we optionally allow people to use something called the credit taxonomy. So you can say exactly what the roles are of the, the different authors. So I think that's sort of a good thing and make, makes it clearer. So if you're submitting, please do uh, include that information. Um, yeah, there's every, under the ICMJE guidelines, everyone must have read and approved the final version of the manuscript, okay? Everyone is responsible for the content. It's not just the senior author, all the authors. Uh, I realize that does not always happen as it should. Of course, the submitting author usually ticks the box, right? Say, so, yes, yes, it's all fine. Um, and so you should take those responsibilities seriously. And you know, there've been many times when people really want me to be an author on a paper because they think it will help them to bias this. And it's like, no, I haven't read the paper. I'm not going to read your paper. I don't know. Um, and, and people, there's this sort of, you know, authorship is somehow cheap and spreading authorship around is like a gift that you're giving. So this is completely wrong and, and the wrong approach. And everyone must be responsible for the manuscript and understand it. Maybe not every detail, but you know, at least in principle. So Alex, I'd like to take a second to take that over here um, um, uh, to, to think about um, the future in a positive way. So there's been a long history in AI of trying to build AI systems that can do science. I'm thinking of maybe Ross King, robot yeah. scientists, yeah. and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it is absolutely possible, we know, that AI systems can contribute to the design of experiments, uh, to the interpretation of results, and the like. That has been a goal of our field for a long time. Mm -hmm. So now that we're kind of on the precipice, maybe, of having systems that might actually be useful broadly in science, we seem to be stamping our feet and saying, no, 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 don't do that. So how can we get to a place where we can collaborate with the kinds of systems that can really help drive science forward mm -hmm. faster, cheaper, better, whatever, um, and publish using them? How do, you, how, do, how do we get there from here? Oh, it's, I mean, philosophically, it's a fascinating question and area. So uh, yeah, I, I mean, across Twitter, we see N of one experiments of writing, you know, giving large language models of big data, sort of epidemiology data sets, and it comes up with plausible hypotheses and you can write uh, at least a, an outline draft of a paper. And that's exciting, right? Okay, so today I go into the office rather than writing one tenth of half a paragraph of one paper, I'd sift through 50 papers that have been auto-generated in my field and assess which ones are the more, you know, or the most interesting science directions. And perhaps this will increase productivity enormously and improve the science that we do. So we certainly shouldn't stamp this out at this point. I agree we should be exploring it. I think that the robot scientist, this still fits within the kind of the guidelines that we've been through today. Um, except you couldn't have the, the language model writing the paper for you. At the end of the day, uh, you're going to have to write the paper about the work that the, the robot scientists did. It, if the day comes that you actually do have to systematically assess the papers for being created by presumably models, how yes. do you about it? Well, at that point, the models are good enough that they can do the reviews. <laughs> but if, they, if you trust them to write the papers and do the science, then they should be able to assess the papers too. So I think at that point we all go and play golf or something. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks a lot.